Why don't you rise up as we pray together? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the wonderful people of this church. As we come to share and to study the word of God today, bless your people in the study of the word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can be seated. I told you before, the Beatitudes means great blessedness or great happiness. We're looking at it from verse 3. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. That's what we're looking at today. The Lord just said, Blessed, 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 all the way through. Now you will need to understand that Jesus Christ was referred to as the son of David. And it's very interesting that the son of David preached, taught, like the psalm of David. The son of David, the psalm of David. When you open the psalms, what do you find? You find that word blessed at the beginning of that of the psalms. And then it goes on and on and on, talking about the blessed people, the blessed man. Look at Psalm 1, reading from verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the, in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. As the psalm of David began, it began with blessed, happy, fortunate, and blessed by the Lord. And then it continues, just like the son of God, son of David came, and he began his message by blessed at the point spirit, Blessed are they that mourn, and blessed are the meek, because they shall inherit the earth. In Psalm 32, verse 1, Psalm 32, verse 1, still following after the Psalms of David, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. No lie, no deception, no insincerity, no hypocrisy. And then he goes on in Psalm 65. Psalm 65, I'm reading from verse 4. In Psalm 65, verse 4, it says, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy court. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Do you see the tenor of the Psalms? Do you see the path of the Psalms? That the path of the Psalms is telling us, describing for us, paving for us, constructing for us the way into the blessedness of the Lord. That's exactly what Christ, the son of David, has come to do. He has come to show us the way of blessedness. And if you will follow the words of Christ, the path that he paved, the road that he constructed, the way that he has made for us, your life will be a blessed life, a happy life, a joyful life, a fortunate life, a glorious, gracious life. In Psalm 84, Psalm 84, I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 84, we're reading from verse 4. Here the Lord is still telling us through David the blessedness of the people that follow the Lord in verse 4. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still be praising thee. Verse 5, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them. In verse 12, O Lord of hosts, Blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. That's what David is telling us, and that's what Christ is telling us. You're wondering, how can I be blessed? Here is the way. How can I be happy? Here is the way. 
How can I have the grace of God, the goodness of God, the glory of God upon my life? Here is the way. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord. And then he'll be rejoicing in the satisfaction, the goodness of the Lord. In Psalm 94, Psalm 94, I'm reading to you from verse 12. Psalm 94, verse 12, verse, verse 13. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. It says you'll see the, uh, the, the pit of the wicked. They fall into the pit that they have dug and that all the people have dug for them because of the judgment of God upon them. And yet it says the people who know the Lord, the people who trust the Lord, the people who follow the Lord, they have the blessedness, the happiness, and the joy of following the Lord in their lives. Psalm 106, 106, verse 3. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. The blessed people, they are the people that follow the way of God. They obey the word of God, and they do the will of God all at all times, all the time. And it says such people are blessed. Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 1. 119 verse 1, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, that seek him with their whole heart. They also do know iniquity, they walk in his ways. Isn't it very clear that when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. You're born again. Your sins are cleansed. Your sins are washed away. And you put your faith, your trust, and your confidence in God. Because Christ died for you on the cross of Calvary. And now you rest in him. And you reckon on him. And you are relating with him every time. And you are reflecting the light of Christ in your life. It says, that's the blessed man. That's the blessed woman. That's the blessed child. And they do not do any iniquity. When looking at Psalm 128, and I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 128, reading from verse 1. The blessed people. Here it says, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. These are the blessed people, and these are the fortunate people, and these are the happy people. These are the people that the Lord will fulfill his promises for. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be. It shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children, like holy plants, round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. And so you find that as Jesus came and he began to talk to the people and he gave this long message, this encouraging message, Days of lift, uplifting message he started telling the people how they can be blessed. And when you come to Christ, that's what the Lord is interested in. He wants you to be blessed. And he begins to describe to you how you can be blessed. Here then is the way into blessedness. And the blessed and the blessed way or the way of blessedness is here open to everyone. Come in then, enter through the gate and be blessed. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 3. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It says, this is where to start. You see, you cannot jump from level 1 and jump to level 3. You have to start at the first point, at the gate. And it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. That means those who are lowly in spirit. 
those who are contrite in spirit, those who are sorrowful because of their sin, and those who repent, they turn away from all their sins. Those boys be not proud in spirit, not haughty in spirit, not exalted in spirit, not lifted up in spirit. Those who are poor in spirit, it says, Blessed are those poor in spirit because the gate into the kingdom of heaven will be opened unto them. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then it says, Blessed are they that mourn. Why do they mourn? Number one, because of their past sins. When they see the evil that they are seeing at cost, they mourn. When they see the irreparable damage that their sins of the past are done, they mourn. Yes, I understand where can be forgiven. And forgiveness is wonderful. But, but you think about it, the sin that David committed, I know God could forgive him, but Rias was dead already. Not only, not only that, the child that was born was dead already. Yes, there's forgiveness. But when you think of the influence, the bad influence you had, the negative influence you had, the lives you damaged because of your sin, of course you will mourn. Yes, God can forgive. Look at Paul the Apostle. Already, Stephen was dead. And the people that were thrown into the prison, already they suffered. Yes, God forgave him, son of Tarsus. But the damage he did, the oppression he caused, the torment he caused for people, what could he do? Blessed are they that mourn. Oh Lord, how sorry I am for the things I did in the past. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your pardon. Thank you for your salvation. But the people that I hurt in the past, I mourn because of the negative influence we had in the past. And Jesus said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then now it says, After you have been poor in spirit, and you have mourned because of your sin, then you come to the point where you are meek. Why are you meek? Oh, because you realize you're all you are by the grace of God. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me and died for me. It's not a force to brag about anything after we are saved and to say, see who I am. See what I am doing. See what I can achieve. Now, we are me. What does it mean to be meek? It means to be humble. It means to be lowly. It means to be gentle. It means to be submissive. It means to be patient. It means to be calm and quiet. It means to be unresisting, unruffled. That's why Jesus said, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the lowly. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are the submissive. Blessed are the patient. Blessed are the calm and quiet people. Blessed are the unresisting, unruffled. That's what he was saying. Because for they shall inherit the earth. The people of the world will go the opposite direction. While Jesus is teaching the way of meekness, they teach the way of aggression and the way of violence and the way of self-assertion. But the Lord does not want any of his children to be like that. He doesn't want us always to be fighting our way through life. And you know there are people that fight their way through life. They're almost like Jacob. As Jacob was coming out of the womb, he was holding the heel of Esau. And he fought and fought and fought to the end of life almost. The Lord doesn't want the disciples of his, the followers of Christ, the children of God, to be like that, struggling, fighting, being violent, demanding, struggling, all through life. He wants us to be gentle as, gentle as a lamb. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to be meek. And he says, here is the secret of blessing, that you will be meek and lowly. Now, this being meek, look at this again, in verse 4. Blessed, verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Is that a kind of new doctrine with Christ? Or can we find something like that back in the Psalms? And let us come back to Psalm 37. In Psalm 37, we're looking at verse 11. Verse 37, verse 11. It says, But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. 
you, you will see then that it's been there in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, that the Lord exalted meekness and exalted the meek. Now we're going to divide the study today to three parts. Number one, proper perspective of meekness. The proper perspective of meekness. Number two, proving people with meekness. Proving people with meekness. Then, number three, we'll be looking at promised possession for the meek. Promised possession for the meek. Let's come to number one, proper perspective of meekness. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek. For there, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. The meek are those who have entered into the kingdom already. They've gone through verse 3. You cannot jump into verse 5 without passing through verse 3. Not only that, they have mourned for their sins of the past and for the sins of others that they influenced to sin. Meekness shows that the forgiven sinner is grateful and is appreciative of the blessing of God upon his life. Now, when we say the meek, what does it really mean? Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. I want to tell you, meek, meekness begins within. It's an inner emotion. It's an inward disposition. It's an attitude of the heart. Actually, a meek person is carrying on every relationship he has with the principle that is anchored on seven things. Number one, the principle of no rage or anchor. When we say somebody is meek, he has a principle. And that principle is embedded within, entrenched within, and is implanted within. That in his life, because he's meek, he lives, he relates, he talks, he interacts on the basis of the principle of no rage, no rancor. Number two, no rashness, no recklessness. You see, when somebody is meek, it's not a reckless fellow. A person that just, you know, pushes everything down, pushes everybody down, and then very rash in taking decision. A little problem in the family is already packing load. I, I'm going. I cannot stay here. If you are meek, you'll not. You'll be working on the principle of no rashness and no recklessness. Number three, no rudeness or resentment. A person that is meek, the principle of your life, the principle by which you work, by which you relate, by which you do everything, is on the principle of no rudeness or resentment. Number four, no revolt or rebellion. You see, when somebody is meek, he cannot revolt, he cannot rebel, because there is a principle within, embedded within, implanted within. And because of that, there is no revolt. He has a quiet spirit. He has a quiet mind. He has a calm emotion. And is evenly composed. It's not, you know, today, boy, trust, and tomorrow in the valley. It's just even. And it's well composed. That's a meek person. He acts on the principle of no revolt, no rebellion. Number five, no revenge or retaliation. You see a person who is meek, it's like a worm. Uh, have you seen those ants? When the ants, if, if you will just stay somewhere and you watch an ant coming and then you put your leg or you put a stick there, the, the ant will not shout, will not cry. The ant will see that obstacle and turn the other way and just walk its way. He knows his goal. He knows where he's going. And even, you, even though you put an obstacle there, it's not going to fight you. It's not going to just quietly. He'll move around, around the obstacle and go his way. That's meekness. When you are meek and you are walking on the principle of no revenge, no retaliation, you do not spend the rest of your life trying to fight this and fight that. After all, you are meek. If there is an obstacle, you avoid that obstacle and see go your way and see be able to reach your goal. Number six, it works on the principle of no rioting or rampaging. It doesn't run wide. You see, there are people, a little thing, their place of work. 
And then they, they, they go on rampage. And then there's trial team. A meek person doesn't do that. A meek person doesn't have anything to do with the people that are giving to rioting and rampaging. Number seven, a person that is actually meek, he does not have the principle of rivalry. He says, no rivalry or rat race running. Rat race running. Have you heard the expression before that they are running the rat race? That means they're competing with one another. They want to be better than so-and-so, higher than so-and-so, greater than so-and-so, more recognized than so-and-so. A meek person does not want to be better than you are. He wants to be better than he was. He compares his achievement today not with your achievement. He compares his achievement today with his achievement yesterday. He says, I want to be better than what I was yesterday. I'm comparing myself with myself. Tomorrow, I want to be better than I am today. You see, a person who is meek is not in competition with you. It's not running rat race with you. It's not trying to conquer you or to win over you or to trample over you or to be better than you are. That's not his concern. A meek person wants to be better than he was yesterday so he can glorify the Lord more and more. So when we look at a meek person, it's an inward principle. It's an inward emotion. And that's what we're learning here. Now, there are seven things that are associated with meekness. Let's look at them one by one. Psalm 45. Psalm 45. I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 45, reading from verse 4. Here we read in verse 4. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness. Because of truth and meekness. Then it goes on and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Now, when we say somebody is meek, it doesn't mean that he's a foolish man. He's an idiot. He's an unthinking man. He's a man you can just, you know, you can uh, put error down his throat. And he will not mind. After all, I am meek. And because I am meek, even when you put error in my front, tell me, swallow it. Then I have to swallow error. That's not meekness. That's foolishness. But you see, when we talk about the meek, meekness and truth are joined together. You keep the truth of the word of God. You keep the truth of the doctrine of the Bible. And yet you are gentle. And yet you are meek. And yet you are loving. And yet you are unruffled. And yet you are calm and composed. Therefore, you understand the connection between truth and meekness. And then, number two, meekness and righteousness. We're looking at Sephaniah chapter 2. Sephaniah, uh, that's uh, near the end of the Old Testament. Sephaniah chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 3. Sephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be, ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Here we learn, something should interest you here. It says, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. It tells us then, already these people in verse 3 are meek. Already are meek. It says, seek the Lord. Who are you talking to, Sephaniah? I'm talking to the meek of the earth. And yet it goes on by saying in, in that verse 3, it says, seek righteousness, seek meekness. And you know there are people that feel that the meekness of yesterday is enough for today. And they say, since I became born again, since I became sanctified, since I became a child of God, I see meekness in my life. And then you come to the Bible study like this, and you say, what are they talking about? They're talking about meekness. Oh, this Bible study, all right, I'll take notes so I can go and teach other people. As for me, I'm meek already. See, it says, you're already meek. Ye meek of the earth, seek righteousness and seek, and seek meekness. Which means, although you're meek already, although the grace of God has come into your life already, and the gentleness of the Lord is already visible, noticeable in your life, yet it says, don't stop there. There's a deeper meekness. 
There's a higher meekness. And it says, keep on seeking and seek righteousness and meekness. But notice this, there's righteousness in connection with the meekness. And you know, there are people that will think if you're very meek, if somebody comes to tell you to be unrighteous, then you say, well, since I am meek, a meek person will never argue. A meek person will never reject anything that other people say. They might tell you to compromise. And they might tell you, now you cannot stand on that righteous principle and just maintain your ground and say, I will not do that. I will not comply. After all, don't, don't you say you are meek? And if a person is meek, don't you think that he should submit to every oppressor and should submit to every false prophet? You say, no, no. Because there's connection between meekness and righteousness. And anything that makes you to deny righteousness or to swap away or to go away from righteousness, if you say you're humble and gentle, that's you meet you that will lead you to hell but you see if you're going to be meek you keep the righteousness number three now number one truth and meekness together number two meekness and righteousness together number three we have meekness and love we're looking at first corinthians chapter four. First corinthians chapter four and we're looking at verse 21 first corinthians chapter four we're reading from verse 21 here is paul the apostle talking to the corinthian believers and he asked them a question and in this question we have a revelation of what meekness is connected with here he tells us what will ye shall i come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness number three then there is a connection between love and meekness love and meekness uh, you know there are some people they will appear very humble very sheepish very sluggish very quiet very meek but inside the heart there's malice inside the heart there's something different from love inside the heart there is the fire and the smoke of hatred coming up Big, but they're quiet people naturally and when you see them you say hey, this fellow is very meek don't let them deceive you by their quiet look because if there's no love there if there is hatred in the heart if there is malice in the heart if there is the intention and the desire and the plan to revenge and oppress the other fellow uh, that meekness is not of god but you see if there is meekness there's a connection between that meekness and love if that connection is not there that meekness is not genuine let's look at number four number four is gentleness gentleness in second corinthians chapter 10 verse 1 second corinthians chapter 10 we're looking at verse 1 second corinthians 1 10 verse 1 now i paul myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. You see the connection. Uh, that's why we study the Bible. That's why this is Bible study. That we don't just say, okay, this is what meekness is. And then we let it go like this and run off. But you see, as you look at the word of God, you begin to see, all right, if I'm going to have the meekness of the Bible, I must have to ask yourself. Jesus Christ said, I am meek and lowly meek and lowly didn't he keep the truth of course he did wasn't he righteous of course he was and wasn't he also loving of course he was wasn't he gentle of course he was which means then the meekness cannot be isolated or separated or divided from these elements and these virtues in our lives there is meekness with gentleness number five meekness and lowliness meekness and lowliness uh, we're reading from ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 we're reading verse 2 ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 with all lowliness and meekness you see that with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering for bearing one another in love enduring and for bearing one another in love you see then meekness is also connected with lowliness in fact that's what jesus said turn your bible to matthew chapter 11 
Matthew chapter 11. I'm reading to you from verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You see the connection there? I am meek. What's the evidence of that? And lowly in heart. And then it says, And ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And then now we come to number five. Number six, meekness and humility. Meekness and humility. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Colossians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 12. Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, by words of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. Meekness and long suffering with humbleness of mind. Which means then, as we talk about meekness, we're talking about humility. You cannot talk about a proud, meek man. You know, you, you see that man there, he's so meek, but he's proud. At the same time, impossible. If he's meek, he'll be lowly. If he's meek, he'll be gentle. If he's meek, he'll be humble at the same time. And then we're told number seven, meekness and a quiet spirit. We're reading First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 4. First Peter chapter 3, and we're reading there in verse 4. Here it says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, the ornament, the beauty of a meek and a quiet spirit. Have you seen some so-called Christian? They're so noisy. And they're so lousy. And they're so rough. And they're so rude. They're so boisterous. It's like, uh, almost like they act as thoughts. But you see, if we're meek, there'll be quiet spirit. The inner man will be calm, will be composed, will be quiet. And that is how we know that somebody has the virtue and the quality of meekness in his life or in her life. Let me read that verse to you again in verse 4. It says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. That means you are concentrating on developing the inner man. You are concentrating on making the inner man relate with Christ, reflect Christ, and be like Christ. And the gentleness is there within. The meekness is there within. The quiet spirit is there within. You have a quiet heart, a quiet spirit, a humble spirit, a quiet life. You are not the noisy type, the aggressive type, the boisterous type, the one that is pushing everything down so you can have your way. A quiet and meek spirit, a meek and quiet spirit. You see then as we have read in the scriptures, that meekness that is acceptable in the sight of the Lord is joined and connected with number one, truth. Number two, righteousness. Number three, love. Number four, gentleness. Number five, lowliness. Number six, humility. Number seven, quietness of spirit. And this is what the Lord desires in our lives. He tells us in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, the self-control. Against such, there is no law. How do you know that you are in the Spirit? How do you know you are born of the Spirit? How do you know you are walking in the Spirit? How do you know you are living in the strength and the power of the Spirit? How do you know that the Spirit of God is abiding and dwelling and living inside you by bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Because if the Spirit of God is there, His fruit will be there. What fruit? Love. Joy. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. It will not be the joy of alcohol. 
and the joy of worldly celebration and the joy of getting things from the world in dubious ways and the joy of having your own way and doing your own thing it will be the joy the joy of the spirit because this joy is the fruit of the spirit and then it says there will be peace the calmness in your soul as deep as, re as a river and long suffering that's talking of patience and of course there will be gentleness 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 with children gentleness with women gentleness with subordinates gentleness with the people that if you hurt them they cannot fight back they are poor they have no defender they cannot take a lawyer against you and even though you know even if you torment them there's nothing they can do against you yeah because the fruit of the spirit is there there will be gentleness from you towards them and goodness kindness and faith fidelity faithfulness and meekness that's the fruit of the spirit it was then the commandment of the lord for you and for me titus chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 2 titus chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 2 to speak evil of no man to be no brawler but gentle showing all meekness unto all men showing all meekness unto all men and that's what the lord is telling us now we know the proper perspective of meekness uh, can we show people in the bible that actually had this quality this virtue of meekness that leads us to point number two proving people with meekness proving people with meekness and let me start by telling you what we're not to do as a result of meekness you see the meekness we're talking about it should be christ-like meekness christ-like meekness and this is not the same as weakness of character you see, there are people that feel that if you're meek, that means you're weak in your character. It means you lack conviction. It means you're timid. You have, you have timidity of spirit or you're passive. You have a passive disposition of temper and character like Aaron. You know, Aaron, that's not meekness. Moses went to the mountain top and then to get the law of the Lord for the people. And the people came and they said, as for this Moses, we don't know what has happened to him. Up, get us an idol that we can serve. And then he said, bring all the golden things that you have. And they brought and then he made uh, something for them. And he said, these be thy gods, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then God said, Moses, go down. This is your people. They've gone away from me. They've started worshiping idols. And then Moses came and he said, Aaron, what have you done? He said, please, don't, don't be annoyed with me. You know these people. They came to me and he said, make, make them an idol. And what could I do? You know them. I don't have that standing firm, that conviction, that courage to be able to stand against their demand. That's not meekness. That's compromise. And then in the case of Eli, hey, you know Eli, and you know his story, that's not meekness. Children, why are you doing this? Why am I hearing all this about you? If a man for, uh, offends another man, there will be somebody to plead for him. But if you offend God, who will plead for you? Don't let me hear this again. And he kept them there in the priesthood. That's not meekness. A person that does not have the courage and the conviction of character to put things that are wrong, put them straight, that's not meekness. It's not like the case of David either. In a particular instance, let me show you what I mean. In 1 Kings chapter 1, 1 Kings chapter 1, I am reading to you from verse 5 and verse 6. 1 Kings chapter 1, reading from verse 5 and verse 6. Then Adonijah. The son of Haggis exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, a beautiful, handsome man. And his mother bare him after Absalom. 
You see that kind of father, a kind of father that will not say, where are you coming from? You close school by 2 o'clock, and now you are coming back home at 7.30. Where have you been? What have you been doing? Are you running around with bad boys or bad girls? You know, a father that will never challenge the child. He will never say, why have you done this? Don't do that again. If you do that again, I'll lay my hands on you, and I'll teach you some good, good lessons you didn't learn in school. And I'll say, Father... But you know, a father that is such a jellyfish, no backbone, and cannot correct anything that is wrong. And these children, you know what Absalom did? You know what Adonijah did? Making themselves king while the king was still alive. That's not the kind of meekness we are talking about. So don't get us wrong and say, well, we are to be me. Don't correct your children. Don't correct the members of the church. Don't correct workers in the church. And don't, uh, you know, ask questions from your wife. Don't ask questions from your husband. Whatever they are doing, just say, God bless you. God bless you. You know, since I went to the Bible study, and he told us about meekness, now I am meek. Even if you are walking on me, and even if you are tearing the Bible, even if you are going to false doctrine, God bless you. God bless you. Why are you doing that? We are told to be meek. Ah, that's compromise. I said that is compromise. We will be meek, but we'll stand for the truth. Hey, look, at, look at the word of God. Look at the word of God in First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. And follow after righteousness, follow after godliness, follow after faith, follow after love, follow after patience, follow after, what's the next thing? Meekness. Look at the next verse. Fight the good fight of faith. Hey, don't misunderstand. Being meek does not mean you don't have any spine. Being meek does not mean you don't have any courage. Being meek does not mean you don't have any conviction. After you have said, follow after faith, follow after righteousness, follow after patience, follow after love, follow after meekness, then it says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. But all the same now, who are the people we can point to in the Bible? They were meek. Number one, Abraham. Number one, Abraham. Look at Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, we're reading from verse 5. Genesis chapter 13, we're reading from verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abraham, at flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdsmen of Lord's cattle. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lord, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren, is not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. That's the meekness we're talking about. Not fighting for your right. But you fight for the glory of God. Not defending self, but you defend the glory of the Almighty God. Not standing by your own word. I said it, I will carry it out. But standing by the word of God. You see, when we talk about meekness, you are not fighting for your right. You are not defending yourself. You are not trying to get an upper hand upon over the other fellow. That's the meekness. And that's what Abraham demonstrated. Now, in the case of Moses, let's look at Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, we're looking at verse 3. Numbers chapter 12, reading from verse 3. Now, the man Moses 
was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. That was the comment of God concerning him, very meek above all the men upon the earth. Then what happened? Read from verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And he said, As the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses, as he not spoken also by us. And the Lord heard it. Then in verse 4, And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam and the bulls came forth and he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and it departed, and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, At last, my Lord, I beseech thee, let me not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is consumed, when he cometh out of his, of a, of his mother's womb. And Moses cried, Unto the Lord saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. That's meekness. They spoke against him, but he will not defend himself. But when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram touched the glory of God, and they wanted to dissuade the children of God, the children of Israel, from following the way of the Lord, then you understand. Moses now came out with the conviction and courage of a leader. And he said, all you people pay attention. If these people die in natural death, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the earth opens and swallows them up alive, then you know that the doctrine, the teaching we're giving you is of God. Before he finished talking, the earth opened and swallowed them up. He was meek when it came to offense against him. He will not defend himself. He prayed for the offenders. But when it came to touching the glory of God and wanting to deceive the people of Israel from following the way of the Lord and to follow error, he became firm and strong. Fight the good fight of faith. But in your relationship with people, when they offend you, then you must be meek and gentle, not defending yourself. Meekness demonstrated by Abraham, number one. Number two, by Moses. Number three, by Gideon. Look at Judges. In Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 1. And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou dost served us, that thou callest us not, when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And did he charge with him sharply, and he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the graves of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? And God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what have I, was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated towards him when he had said that. You see, a soft answer. Not being aggressive as they were aggressive against him. They said, you went to the battlefield. You should have called us. Why did you go without us? They said, what have I done? Look at your own victory. Look at your own success. 
You are higher, you are greater, you are better than I am. What victory have I won in comparison with the victory you have won? When he spoke like that, with meekness, then they let it go like that. You see, a soft answer will turn away wrath. And what the Lord is telling us is that in our interaction with people, in our discussion with people, in our relationship with people, if somebody is talking rough and talking high, if you are humble, talk low and talk humble and talk gentle between husband and wife. The man comes in and then he bumps inside the house. Where are you? Where are you? What did I hear? And after saying that kind of thing, if, if, if it's fire for fire, there'll be flame. But if there is fire and then there's water, well, quench that fire by meekness. And the wife responds, and my husband, why are you talking like that? It's not like that at all. Actually, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. If the man is talking high and you are talking humble and low, there will be no fire, there will be no flame, there will be no fighting, there will be no divorce, there will be no separation. And the same thing in the place of work your director, your boss, or whoever he is, he comes in. You have not finished that assignment. You are playing with your job. You'll soon lose your job. Look at this and look at this. You are going to make this scene later. And then when he talks like that, if you reply and say, is this the only place to work? Why are you talking to me like that? Am I a slave? Am I a schoolboy? See, I'm a graduate. Don't talk to me like that. If you want to take your, take your job, you'll lose that job. Then you come, you say, Pastor, pray for me. They are persecuting me. <laughs> because you don't have meekness. But if your director is saying something rough, and then you are very humble, and you are very gentle, and say, no, I, I, I will try my best. I understand why you are under pressure. I know you want to submit this in time. I'll do my best. Nobody will stop your appointment, will stop your employment because of that. You see, gentleness... Being confronted, uh, or, or maybe for, force, or forcefulness being confronted by gentleness and meekness will solve a lot of problems for us. Let's look at number four. She is Anna. In 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're talking about meekness. Chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 13. Now Anna, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought that she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Anna answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. You see how Anna replied? If she had replied in another way, fire for fire, then she would not have that boy, Samuel, that he had eventually. But it's the meekness and the gentleness in the way she replied, that man of God, that's what solved the problem. Number five, we're looking at another person. This is David now. We're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 5. In 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5, And when David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed seal as he came. And he cast stones, not dust, not pebble, stones at David. And at all the servants of, the king, of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men that were on the right hand and on his sledge. And thus she may when, thus said she may, when he cursed, come out, come out. Thou bloody man. The man of Belial. He was talking to the king, King David, like that. And then the Lord had returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. What if somebody speaks to you like that? You are the director in a place of work. 
You are the manager in the place of work. You are the leader among the people. You are an exalted man, a professor in that institution. And now because you had a little trouble, and then you still have some people around you, supporting you, defending you, surrounding you. And somebody like Shime came out talking loud and throwing stones at you and saying, bloody man, foolish man, now you are suffering for your sin. What would you have done? Look at David in verse 9. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, uh, said unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? Let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said uh, to Abishai and to all the servants, Behold, my own son, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord has bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction. And that, and, and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary, refreshed themselves there. Hey, look at David here. He will not defend himself. No, he will not. He will not defend himself. That's the meekness we are talking about. When the meekness of the Lord can so be entrenched, embedded, and uh, it, it, within your heart, that you will be able to say, by the grace of God, I don't defend myself. Let them curse. Let them abuse. Let them insult. Whatever the insult or the assault, I'm not going to raise my hand against them and throw anything at them. And that's the meekness the Lord is teaching us. And that's number five, number six, Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle. In First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 7. First Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. That's gentleness, that's meekness, that's humility, that's lowliness, all combined together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 12, and labor walking with our hands being reviled we're blessed being reviled we're blessed being persecuted we suffer it being defamed we entreat we are made as the fields of the world and are the us of scoring of all things unto this day can you imagine Saul of Tarsus before he became converted, before he became born again, who could have done this to him? But the new birth, the salvation experience does a lot in our lives that now he says, I'm helpless. When I was a sinner, I used to get into the houses of those innocent people, whisk them out and send them to the prison. I used to even force them to blaspheme. And I, and I persecuted this way unto death. An aggressive man, a violent man. But now he became born again. He met the Lord. And he said, Now, as we are reviled, we keep on blessing them. As we're persecuted, we suffer it quietly, patiently, quietly, and, and silently. And then we are defamed, but we entreat, we plead, and we beg. We are made the fields of the world. The offscoring of all things, even unto this day. That's the meekness the Lord is telling us to manifest. Now, number seven is our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Very meek, very lowly, very gentle. And even when He was accused wrongly, He opened not His mouth. Isaiah chapter 53. 
In Isaiah chapter 53, I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before a shearers is dumb. And he, so he opened not his mouth. That's meekness. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ is inviting you and inviting me to follow after his example. In Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. It tells us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me. Learn of me. Don't just learn from my message. Learn from my manner of life. He was accused. Yet he opened not his mouth. Uh, what if this came to you? What if uh, your pastor here called you? And he said, uh, this is what I'm hearing about you. You're not living right. Something is wrong with you. And I have reports concerning you that you've done this, 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 and this. And you want to say, excuse me, pastor, don't talk. You want to make an excuse. Don't defend yourself. Go and pray. Stop the work you are doing. What will you do? You know, the people who say they are Christians today, they begin to talk to other people in the church. You know what the pastor did? The pastor accused me. The pastor is persecuting me. And the pastor said this and this. And I even wanted to say, Pastor, it's not like that. He said, No, don't talk. Don't defend yourself. And you know, before I leave this church, I'm going to scatter everything. And I'm going to pull some people away from me. They did to me in, the, in that church. People talk against me in that church. And even the pastor joined them. And the pastor is persecuting me. I'm going to scatter it for them before I leave. Jesus said, Learn of me and you know there are some workers today in the church even when they do wrong and you can't say brother you even still have the uh, the spirit of god and the gentleness of god to call them brother you say brother sister please come and then they come and they put their shoulders like this and they're ready you know when people want to fight that's the way they look at you and when they want to get ready for a real aggressive battle and conflict, they say, where they stand and they look at you. Sir, they say you are calling me. <laughs> What's the matter? No, they said you are calling me. Talk now. Are you not the one calling me? Here I am. I'm your pastor. You are talking. Yes, you are pastor. Are you God? And the pastor doesn't know what to say again. You know the people of nowadays that say they are Christians. But Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And he says, I will give you rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Then he says, what you have to learn? Because I am meek and lowly. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I pray we will be like the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be meek, we will be lowly, we will be gentle. The way we relate with one another, the way we deal with one another, and the way we speak to one another, I pray that that gentleness will characterize our lives in Jesus' name. Now, number three. Promised possession for the meek. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Inheritance, inheritance. Here the Lord is telling us, if we're meek, and we're going to be meek. I said we're going to be meek. He says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What kind of inheritance? Number one, earthly inheritance. They shall inherit the earth. In Psalm 37, Psalm 37, I'm reading from verse 11. Psalm 37, reading from verse 11. The first inheritance and earthly inheritance. Psalm 37, verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth, 
and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Number two, an edifying, enjoyable inheritance. Enjoyable, edifying inheritance. Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, I'm reading from verse 26. Psalm 22, verse 26. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is governor among the nations. It says, if we're meek, it's going to give us inheritance. Number one, an earthly inheritance. Number two, an edifying, enjoyable inheritance. Number three, expected inheritance. Expected inheritance. We're looking at um, uh, Psalm 25. Psalm 25, verse 9. In Psalm 25, verse 9, the meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. And there are many crossroads in our lives. And there are many expectations in our lives. You want to get married? Yes, he can guide and he will guide. You want to change jobs? Yes, he will guide. He can guide. You are thinking of whether to travel or not to travel to that particular place? Yes, he can guide. And, and you, you, you are expecting the revelation of the Lord, the mind of the Lord concerning this decision, that decision. Yes, he says, he'll give us the expected inheritance. On the one condition we're meek, he says, the meek will he guide. The meek will he guide in judgment. And the meek will he teach his way. Jeremiah chapter 29. In Jeremiah 29, I'm reading from verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. To give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. It's telling us that we can have the expected inheritance number four, enduring lifelong inheritance. Enduring lifelong inheritance in first peter chapter 3 first peter chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 4 first peter chapter 3 verse 4 but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of god of great price come on to verse 9 not rendering evil for evil, that's a meek person. Nor, or railing for railing, that's how to be meek. But contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye should inherit, inherit a blessing. You see, the people who are meek, and they do not walk on the principle of fire for fire, railing for railing. Injury for injury, stone for stone, insult for insult. They don't work on that principle. They are meek. And when you insult them, they bless you. They plead with you. They beg you. They are humble. They are lowly. They are loving. It says you are called to such a lie so that you'll be able to inherit a blessing. In verse 10, for he that will love life, life long inheritance, and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his leaves that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it, that is to be sure of it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Number five, exceptional inheritance. Exceptional inheritance. A kind of peculiar inheritance that God doesn't just give to every dick and harry, but he reserves them for the people who are beloved in his sight. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, 
I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. To give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. This is not an inheritance for every dick and hurry. This is exceptional that he gives to the people who are sanctified. And because they are sanctified, because they are purified, because the self-nature had been circumcised, had been rooted out and now they are meek and lowly and lovely and loving it says I'm going to give them exceptional inheritance Acts chapter 26 Acts chapter 26 verse 18 Acts 26 verse 18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that's in me. Sanctified by faith that's in Christ. Christ was talking to uh, Paul and it was Christ that said me there. Sanctified by faith that's in me. You see such people, they receive exceptional inheritance. Number six, they receive everything on earth, everything in heaven. Everything on earth, everything in heaven. You see, the people who follow after the Lord and the people who follow after the lifestyle, after the principle of meekness and gentleness and love, here is what they receive. Everything on earth, everything in heaven. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. He that overcometh. You see the, the aggressive nature. If you are overcome, the aggressive nature. If you overcome, the tendency to riot, the tendency to be rude, the tendency to be rash, the tendency to be reckless, the tendency to just be here and there, to rebel. If you overcome all that, and then everything is quieting and there is meekness in your soul meekness in your spirit quietness in your mind it says he that overcometh you overcome that bad temper you overcome that bad rampaging emotion it says he that overcometh shall inherit all things and i will be his god and he shall be my son and then he tells us in First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. First Peter chapter 1. Reading from verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Number seven, eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance, everlasting inheritance, endless inheritance. We're looking at Psalm 37. Psalm 37, I'm reading from verse 18. Psalm 37, verse 18. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright. Their inheritance shall be forever. The Lord knoweth the way and the days of the upright. Their inheritance shall be forever. Today we have learned about meekness. And Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. As I close, come back to Zephaniah chapter 3. Chapter 2, rather. Zephaniah chapter 2. In Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. Seek ye the Lord. After you've heard, a study like this in the Word of God, and you look at your heart, you look at your life, you look at your relationship with other people, 
and you look at all the things the Lord has taught us, and the things in your own life contrary and different from this meekness of spirit, mind, and heart. And then you want to seek the face of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. You go to the Lord in prayer. You say, Lord, I do not want to be a hearer of the word only. I want to be a doer of the word. I want to be meek. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Number one, seek meekness. Number two, show meekness in temper. In your temper, all this hot temper, aggressive nature, pushing other people down, wanting to have your way, wanting to crush them, so much in a hurry to get ahead. You don't care what happens to other people. Show meekness in your temper. Number three, search meekness as the standard of living. Set up the standard of meekness. Set meekness as the standard of living in your home, in your place of work, in the church, in your interaction, relationship with people. Search meekness as a standard of living. Number four, submit in meekness. The test will come in your life. The situation will come in your life that will show whether the Bible study has been beneficial to you or not. Submit in meekness. Number five, serve in meekness. Serve in meekness. You know, it's, it's not enough just to serve. Uh, have you gone to a restaurant before? And then somebody is serving you food in the restaurant. Their attitude, their look, their disposition, and the way they even walk, and the way they put it on the table for you sometimes, although they serve you, you almost lose appetite because they do not have the gentleness and the love and the meekness together with their service. We were children of God. The Lord is telling us it's not just to serve, serving other people, serving your fellow man, serving your husband, serving your wife, serving your parents, serving your children, serving the people in the church. Serve in meekness. Number six, sow meekness as a seed. Sow meekness into the lives of the other people. The way you talk to them, the way you relate with them, the influence you have on them, the word you speak unto them, sow meekness as seed. Number seven, share meekness with the Savior. He is our Savior. And he has called us, he said, I am meek and lowly in heart. Follow after my example and share this nature of meekness with Christ. Seek it. Show it. Set it up as a standard. Submit. Serve. Sow. And share meekness. By the grace of God, we will. Amen. I said we will. Amen. Let's rise up and pray. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Let each one talk to the Lord. Demonstrate that meekness even now. Demonstrate that you have had the Bible study and you sincerely, wholeheartedly, respectfully, honorably demand from the Lord that the Lord will grant you this meekness of spirit meekness of heart meekness of life so that the promise the Lord has made will be yours blessed are the meek 
for they shall inherit the earth. When people offend you, there's going to be a great opportunity for you to show that meekness. When there's misunderstanding in the family, there's going to be a great opportunity for you to demonstrate that meekness of character. When insult or assault comes against you from junior people, from subordinates, from the people you are helping, when insult or assault comes against you, that will be a good chance for you to demonstrate meekness. When they lie against you, when they accuse you wrongly, when they are trying to cheat you, that will be a chance for you to show that you have the mind of Christ. And a day's meekness is not theoretical, it's practical in your heart and life. Seek meekness. Seek until you find. Seek it until you receive it. Embedded in your soul. Implanted in your heart. Meekness. Meekness in your language. Meekness in your comportment. Meekness in your relationship, interaction with all the people. Meekness in your behavior. Meekness in your submission to the leadership of your local church. Meekness in the place of work. meekness before the people that cannot do anything against you. Meekness with the truth. Meekness with righteousness. Meekness with lowliness. Meekness with humility. Never defending yourself. Never running other people down to exalt yourself. Never destroy what other people are doing. That what you are doing may be lifted up. Meekness as a principle of life. Meekness guiding your behavior. Meekness guiding your action. Seek it. Show it. Set it as a standard of living for yourself. Serve in meekness. Submit in meekness. Share that nature of meekness with Christ.
without salvation it's impossible you must be saved when you are saved the nature of Christ will be in you it will be your delight your desire your determination to follow after the example of Christ you'll want to be meek it will be your joy to follow after the example of Christ your Lord and Savior meekness and gentleness meekness and humility meekness and a quiet spirit the meekness of Christ the meekness of Christ it will close you it will come out from within you and the closer you get to Christ the more experience you have in Christ the more you'll be meek and the more the blessings of the Lord much inheritance will be in your life the more the fulfillment of the promise of God will be fulfilled in your life realized in your life blessed are the meek blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth Don't you want that blessedness? That blessedness is not for the rough, the rowdy, the rash, and the reckless. That blessedness is for those who are humble, lowly, gentle, meek, submissive, yielding, unruffled, unprovoked let his blessing come upon you let his blessing come upon you it's for the meek blessed are the meek Happy are the meek. But they shall inherit the earth. But they shall inherit the earth. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek his righteousness and seek his meekness. Tell him to beautify your life. Make your life beautiful for this meekness of Christ. Implant that, meek that meekness in your heart. Tell the Lord to do it. If you pray sincerely, if you pray fervently, if you pray faithfully, if you pray trusting the Lord, He will do it. You know your nature, you know your attitude, you know your emotional outburst. You can tell the Lord to bring a supernatural control on that emotional outburst on that boisterous aggressive temper and he will do it and yet meekness is not telling you to compromise your face meekness 
is not telling you to be fearful, timid, of a timid character. No, not at all. So have the courage of faith, the courage of conviction, but you never defend yourself. You only defend the glory of God. Follow after righteousness. Follow after meekness. And yet in the pursuit of righteousness and meekness, fight the good fight of faith. Don't compromise. Don't lower the standard. Don't make yourself cheap before those who want to compel you to backslide. Don't do that. Stand firm. Contending for the faith. Once delivered unto the saints, yet in the midst of defending the truth, be meek, be gentle, be loving, be lowly. Gentleness and meekness in relationship. Gentleness and meekness in the fellowship. Gentleness and meekness in your interaction with people. Don't pretend. Don't be hypocritical. Pray that the Lord will implant within you this genuine experience and a Christ-like nature of gentleness, lowliness, love, and meekness. Meek like Abraham. Not fighting for your right. Fighting for property. Fighting over money. Fighting over life partner. I went to the marriage committee first. I will not allow that. Don't fight over anything. Be like Abraham. Be meek, gentle, and lowly. Be meek like Moses. They speak against you. They insult you. They belittle you. They reproach you. Be meek. Don't defend yourself. Let the Lord Himself defend you. Be like Gideon. Be like Gideon. Other people want to accuse you wrongly. And they spit out fire. Don't spit out fire like them. Soft words. Nice word, comforting words, humble words, meek like Gideon, be meek like Anna, you are accused of drunkenness, accused of wrong behavior. When you know you are innocent, don't talk back, don't be rude at your leaders, show them the respect that they deserve, be meek.
like Paul the Apostle. Tell the Lord, help me, Lord. I will be me. Above and beyond all, like Jesus Christ, Lord, help me to be as meek as Christ. <laughs>